Praise the Lord. It has been a long time since I put on any fatigues. In fact, I don't know these because I don't want to date myself, but when I was in, we just wore green. How many just wore green? All right. You know what I'm talking about, right? So in basic training, they call you a pickle. At least that's the Air Force, anyway, because that's what you look like as one great big pickle. At least there is some pattern on this one, right? So praise the Lord. God is good, and He is victorious. Amen? We were going to continue the series that Pastor Ryan is doing. This means war. And any time that we have an enemy out here, and by the way, it was really neat because... Um, I think it's really relevant to talk about this during the holiday season. Because it is about war, isn't it? It is about the fact that Satan won in the Garden of Eden, and Jesus was to come and be the solution to that. And even when he was born, it wasn't peaceful. And there was war when Herod wanted to kill all the two-year-olds. So... You know, we are dealing with war every single day of our lives, and it's important, as Pastor Ryan's been talking about, to prepare ourselves for it. So today I want to talk about the rules of engagement. But one of the things I want to share is um, there's something about the military I love. How many are veterans or military right now? All right. We, we just It's really, really neat because I think it kind of parallels God's battlefield, okay? Uh, the first thing that I really appreciate about the military is the hierarchical structure. You know, the fact that someone is in control. There's one person making the calls, you know, instead of a whole bunch of troops doing it. And, and the hierarchical structure simply is arranged by rank. It is an organizational structure where every entity in the organization except one is subordinate to any, to a single other entity. And the result is accountability, because we need accountability in whatever mission we're going to carry out. Well, how many of you know that our accountability is to one commander, and that is Jesus Christ our Lord, right? And so that works even in the church. We don't need a bunch of voices out there saying, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do, this is what you need to do. We have our rules of engagement, and God is the one that tells us what to do. He's the one that formed us. We are created in His image and His likeness, and I figure He has a right to do that. <laughs> the second thing is attention to detail. I don't know if you've been uh, you know, through basic training. Oh, everybody in the military goes through basic training, right? And, and you've, got to, you've got to pay attention to every single detail. I remember one inspection, because they inspect you to make sure you're doing everything right, because you have to fold your clothes a certain way. And to this day, I still fold my underwear the military way. I, I'm serious. It's just, it comes natural, six inches. That's it. And stacked, you know? But you had to fold your socks in equal thirds. And I remember having an inspection one time, and, and, I, and you, you could only have five demerits, and I got six. Do okay. you know why I got six? It's because three pair of socks were not, were not folded correctly. And I said to the TI, why, why don't I only get three? He says it's one demerit for each individual sock. Oh. They, they teach you how to pay attention to detail. And I don't know if you know this, but God is a God of detail. You know, he, he, he does things a certain way. If you look at the tabernacle and the temple and how he wanted them to build it, I mean, it was down to the greatest detail itself. And how he wants us to deal with life is illustrated in his book as well. So there's a hierarchical structure, there's attention to detail, and the third one is belongingness. I love the camaraderie that exists within the military. Because it's like, you know, every veteran knows, you know, hey, you see another veteran, hey, what, where, where'd you serve, you know? And it, there's, there's, a, there's a belongingness, why? Because we need to be together to form the victory in a mission. You can't do it by yourselves. And it's the same thing with the church, isn't it? 
that we are never going to fight the battle by ourselves, but we need one another. And so there's, there's really a close um, analogy, I guess you can say, between the military and the church. And just thinking through that. However, here's where it falls apart. Because it'll fall apart in the military and it'll fall apart in the church if we don't follow the rules of engagement. When we are loners, we're individual, everybody is entitled. There is a meism society that says that I am not going to follow a single commander. I am going to follow my own desires. And this structure falls apart. It even falls apart within the church. If we don't do it the way the Lord wants it done. And we've been talking about that throughout. So today I want to talk about what does it take to win the victory? What kind of rules of engagement are we going to um, engage in here so that we make sure that victory is uh, complete? And the rules of engagement, I looked this up in the uh, basic officer course in the United States Marine Corps. It says the rules of engagement is directives issued by competent military authority that delineate the circumstances and limitations under which military forces will initiate and or continue combat engagement with other forces encountered. That sounds like a lot of stuff, doesn't it? But basically it says, what, why do we go to war and how are we going to do it? That's the rule of engagement. And if we don't do it right, we are going to fail. Okay? And I think the same thing exists within the church and the same thing exists within the body of Christ. God has given us a set of rules. And if you don't like it, God is God, right? There's something very important that we have to understand is that God is God and we are not. And we don't know. Oh, by the way, I think there, there is only one class of people that knows everything, okay? That is the teenagers. <laughs> All right? They're the ones that know everything. But we don't know everything, and what we have to do is we have to follow his rules. And, and why is it? It's not because God wants to kind of puff himself up and make him the king here, because he already is. But we are created in his image and his likeness, and we need to do it his way. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I figure it is important to do it God's way. And so I want to share a story where... Israel did not do it God's way, and they failed. So we're going to go to Joshua chapter 7. Everybody knows the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt, and they come to a Red Sea, and, and God miraculously parts the sea. And they go through there, and they wander for 40 days because they didn't follow the rules of engagement. Right? So then Joshua and that next generation comes in, and they cross the Jordan River miraculously, and then they faced the city of Jericho. And Jericho, they were told to do specific things because God has rules of engagement, if you give me that latitude. And so they marched around the city, they shouted, they blew the trumpets, and God brought the walls down. But they were instructed not to do something, and, they were, and that was they weren't supposed to take anything out of Jericho. Now Joshua checks his... GPS, because he feels, hey, we, this was a cool victory. Now it's time to move on to a city called Ai. But they went to Ai, and we're going to read now what happened to them when they did not follow the rules of engagement. In Joshua chapter 7, starting in verse 1, But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Camry, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aven, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go and up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not worry the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up, and they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. 
Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. <laughs> Isn't that human nature? God just brings them great victory in Jericho and they forgot all about it. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? But you know what God has his say, doesn't he? It said, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied, and they have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. It's very interesting. God didn't do it to them. They were made liable to destruction because what? They did not follow the rules of engagement. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to instruction, to destruction. And there are several lessons that we can learn from Joshua and AI. And it's interesting because here's what I believe about this story. Because you might be thinking, well, why did God allow this to happen to Joshua? You know? But here's the problem. The problem wasn't, because Joshua is like, well, how am I supposed to know? I mean, put yourself in Joshua's you know, place. They had a major victory here, and now they figure, hey, this city is, is, is smaller, and it is not fortified the way we should be able to take it. But how am I supposed to know, Lord, how am I supposed to know that somebody hid something in their tent? That's not fair. But you know what Joshua did not do? He didn't seek of the Lord. He just assumed he looked on a map and he said, well, God's going to give us this land. And he looked there and said, AI is right. But here's what I believe God would have done. If Joshua would have said, Lord, what are we supposed to do now? Don't assume, but what are we supposed to do? You know what God would have said? Don't do anything because there's sin in your camp. So destruction wasn't God's fault. It was Joshua's. And I think it's, in, it's important because I see people all the time that are blaming God for things that happen in their lives and God is still with us and he was still with them. And maybe it's time that as we move forward in these battles in the last days that we seek of the Lord each and every day. And we don't allow ourselves just to assume that we're supposed to do something. And maybe we can actually pray something. Lord, is there anything that hinders me from going forward in you? And I believe God is faithful to make sure that we don't go into destruction. So the three things I want us to learn. God has specific ways of doing things. And when we don't do it, we can lose the battle. And that's what I'm referring to as the rules of engagement. Second, we will most likely fail if we engage the enemy on our own. We need God in our lives to face anything that we are going to face. I don't care what it is. God is the solution for every dilemma that we are going to face. And if you leave God out of your lives and you go forward thinking that, oh, I'm okay, then there's a possibility that something might go wrong. Now, can things go wrong too if God is with us because we are fighting other forces? But I'll tell you what, it won't be wrong in the Lord's eyes. We will be still doing right. It may not go wrong according to our vision and our way. And the third thing is never assume. Always seek. Never assume. This is what God wants me to do. Seek God's hand in it. 
So I want to talk about several rules of engagement today. Several rules that I think will keep us safe and keep us victorious in the Lord because we want victory, right? We don't want defeat. We want to be together and we want to fight the battles that we're going to fight. We want to put on that armor of God. You see, that is an instruction right there in the Lord, isn't it? That's a rule of engagement. Don't go out and fight the enemy without your bat, without your armor. You got to put on every single day. And you've heard what Pastor Ryan's been talking about. And it's such a, po a powerful thing that we have to look at. So the first rule of engagement I want to talk about is know your commander. Know your commander. That sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? But how many of you work for a law, you know, a big corporation or even the military? You know, you don't you may know about a person that is leading, but you don't know him personally. You know, the military would say, hey, we know who the commander in chief is. We know about him, but we don't know him personally. And in Christianity, it's the only structure or organization on the face of this planet that we can know personally the commander that guides and directs us to victory. When Jesus was crucified on the cross and he says it is finished and that curtain was torn in two and we are allowed access to the Holy of Holies, do you realize what that means is that we can get wisdom directly from the commander himself. We have relationship with the commander. We don't need to know about God. We can know God experientially. And that will help us in every victory that we're going to go through. And, and will help us even in any struggle that we're going to have. But why is it important to know God? Hey, I can do it myself. <laughs> you see, that is the prevailing attitude that creeps into the church. That's the prevailing attitude that has crept into society. That we can do it our own way. And it does not work. That's not a good rule of engagement. If you're going to go into battle, if you're going to face anything that you're going to face in your life today, it is important to use God as your commander and obey Him completely. But here's why. In, in Isaiah 55, you know, we've talked about this before. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I just think that's so cool. In other words, we don't know more than God, but we act like we do. And this is where we have to understand that we have a God of, of all, my, all the universe, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has all the wisdom. He has all the strength. He can do anything through us, but we can only do all things through Him who gives us strength. But we have to stay in Him because His ways are not our ways. And 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. And I love that verse because what it says is, You give me the strongest man on the face of the earth, and it doesn't even match the weakness of God, if there was weakness. And you give me the smartest person, the smartest scientist, the highest IQ person on the face of your earth, and it would not even equal the foolishness of God. That's why we need our commander to, to guide and direct our steps each and every way. It's very simple. Secondly, we need to ignore the propaganda. You know, in military struggles... In conflicts, the enemy would try to throw uh, propaganda our way and try to throw us off. And the only way that they were able to throw, not be thrown off is because they knew the directives. They knew what the truth was. And every single one of us today knows what that propaganda is in your head. You know the people that will tell you that you, you don't serve a God that is powerful. You know the thoughts in your head that try to define you in ways that God never ever thought of defining you. You have let human understanding 
believe, you believe the truth of human understanding and you let go of the truth of an almighty God that understands you completely. We have to ignore the lies that go on in our heads. We have to ignore the depression, the anxiety, those things that will drag us down from the victory that God has for us. And we need to believe the truth because that truth will set us free. And the scripture in 2 Corinthians 10 that Pastor Ryan read last week, and we've been using this as well. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The only way that you can ignore the propaganda is to believe and hear the truth of God. And we need to realize that the enemy is going to try to break down that truth in our head. You have thoughts. Every single one of us has thoughts that are not, that are not godly. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And if you believe those thoughts, you will be defeated. It's the rule of engagement is when you hear those thoughts, it is important that you line it up with God's word, that you take the truth and you compare everything that goes on and you allow yourself to believe what God wants you to believe. You ignore the propaganda because it will only weaken you. Amen? Third thing we need to do is to focus on the bigger picture. We need to focus on the bigger picture. How many times do we just focus on a little circumstance and we allow that to define us? When you step outside here, you're going to see only as far as the horizon will let you see. You will only see the obstacles that are in the way to that horizon. But if somebody took you on a helicopter trip, guess what you would see? You would see so much more above and beyond anything that you could imagine is already there. And I kind of call that helicopter vision. And when God sees things a lot clearer than we do, we might struggle down here with something, but God sees the bigger picture. We might go through something in our lives, but God sees the bigger picture. We might have a flat tire, and we don't like it. And we grumble and complain against God. But what is the bigger picture? If we could just put ourselves there. Is it possible that God is delaying us just a little bit? Because he understands that something bad is going to happen down the road. You see, isn't it possible that we could take everything that happens to us and turn it around for good? Because God does that. And we could see the bigger picture on that. And I love what, uh, what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. It's important to understand that what you see is temporary, but God has a power in you that is eternal. And he wants us to understand that no matter what circumstance you're going on, don't focus on your spouse. Don't focus on your kids. Don't focus on your finances. Don't focus on the losses. Don't focus on your job. Focus on him who gives us the strength to handle every one of those situations. We can get so defeated in our, in our culture, can't we? Our resilience level is, is at an all-time low. We fall apart at the least little provocation. I'm just a failure. Oh, no. I'm not going to be able to do anything right. Man, you know, this keeps happening to me over and over and over again. But see, if God sees the bigger picture, he has victory in mind. God ain't leaving you out. He loves you with an everlasting love. And he will never leave you or forsake you. If you believe in the rules of engagement, he says, no matter what you go through, it might seem like it's defeating you, but it is only strengthening you. It is building your resilience. And we have to hold on to that. We have to make sure that God is our strength. Even when things don't look like they're going well, there's a greater plan. I, I, I love American history. Kind of bores Dorothy to death. But you know what? I love it because I can read about American history. And I, re I read a book called uh, 1776 by David McCullough. How many have ever heard of that? 
It's about revolutionary war in, in, in 1776. And he was talking about George Washington. And how many of you know that George Washington had more failures than successes? It, it's, a, it's amazing. When you read about the Revolutionary War, more failures than victories. But look at what God was able to do. But here's the description of George Washington. I've shared this before. He described George Washington's greatest strength was seeing things as they were, not as he would wish them to be. Seeing things as they were, not as he would wish them to be. What does that mean? That means if he had a failure, he said, okay, that's the way it is. Let's move on. But see, what we do is we go, oh, there's a failure. I don't know. It defines me. I don't know what I'm going to do now. And, and, we're, and we'll never escape. But what he did is he, if you focus on what you want and what you wish it to be, you will be crippled for the rest of your lives. And what God is saying to you is look up because I am your victory. I am the one that's going to lead you. I am the one that's going to guide you and direct you every step of the way. Just because you might have failed at something, just because something didn't work out the way you thought you wanted it to work out, we keep our eyes focused on him because that circumstance is temporary. But Jesus is eternal. Amen. Amen. We've got to focus on the bigger picture so we don't let discouragement come about. Next, we need to leave the spoils Leave the spoils. The world will confine you, confound you. The world has so many temptations, doesn't it? The world will entice you. It will pull you away from your devotion, your pure devotion to Christ. And when John said this in 1 John 2, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. God will make sure that he exposes anything in our lives that we might have hold on to in the world. How about that for a prayer? What if you prayed that? I wonder, I, I believe God would answer it, wouldn't he? Lord, is there anything I'm holding on to that I need to give to you? Is there anything that I'm holding on to in this world that is blocking me from my pure devotion to you? How many of you would believe that God would answer that? If you are truly sincere in your heart. But you know what? We are crippled if we hold on to so much of the world, to so much of other people's perceptions, to so much of our plans, because God has a plan for us. And you, you saw what happened with, with Joshua, right? They took some of the spoils. Achan took the spoils out of Jericho, and they failed. Next, stay in the fight. Don't ever give up. Vow to never give up. When you take your eyes off the circumstances and you put them on the Lord, He will give you a strength and no longer will you be bound by defeat. And we can't give up because He is our strength. Greater is He that is in us than He that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Everything is possible with God. There is nothing impossible with the Lord. And we need to stay in the fight. We need to encourage one another, but that's the next point. Look at what Ephesians 6, and this is the foundational scripture of this, of this series. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Do you know how you can stay in the fight? Put on that full armor that Ryan's been talking about. Don't neglect it because every day that you neglect it, you could get discouraged because something will fail you. And every single one of you that does this can attest to the fact that your day goes a little bit better when you spend it with the Lord first, right? <laughs> I always, I always find that fascinating. You'll have a better time staying in the fight when you get to know the commander, you ignore the propaganda, and you focus on the bigger picture. And the bigger picture for you is victory. God wants us to live in victory, so we need to do that. Next, stay unified as a force. 
Not only should we stay in the fight, but this is so crucial to being able to stay in the fight, is stay unified together. And Pastor Ryan's been talking about that. We need each other. No one can be an island. And together we can do great things. But we have to stay together. I, I just find it fascinating that in Genesis 3, the serpent isolated Eve. But if they were together, when that first temptation came, my belief is Adam would have stepped on his head and say, get away from me. And I think we need to do that. We need to be together. We need church. You need us. We need you. Amen. It is so important to do that. And I know that there are people, you know, hey, you know, they're watching here, you know, by the internet, and that's okay. But you know what? It's important to get into a small group. It's important to be able to be together with believers. You can't survive on your own. Look at what 1 Corinthians 12 says, just as the as a body, though uh, just as a body though one has many parts, but it's all of its part, many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And in verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. Each one of you is a part of the body of Christ. You can't say to yourself, I'm not important. God will not let you be unimportant. You will have gifts and talents that you have to offer the Lord. Every single one of us does. And when you put them all together, Satan is not going to come against us. He will not come against this church. But if you are isolated and alone, we can. And that's why we're trying to emphasize discipleship and, and being together and small groups. And we're trying to make a big church more smaller footprints. Because that's what we need. We need to be together. And we will be together to sharpen each other and to make sure that we are strong. Ecclesiastes 4 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. That's where God's strength is. We have strength in numbers. The gates of hell will not prevail against us. And that's what Jesus said. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because we are unified together. Amen. And finally, the last thing I want to talk about as we close is we need to rescue the POWs. The prisoners of war. Those that are left behind. And what are we talking about? There's really two classes of people I want us to understand. One is the lost. See, they're prisoners of war. They already are captured by the enemy. They are already in enemy's territory. But we need to rescue them. And what you've been hearing a lot from Pastor Ryan and his vision is that we are evangelists. And we go out and spread the gospel. And we bring as many people as we can. We rescue them from the clutches of the enemy. And we bring them into the fold of healing. We bring them into Christ. And we help them to understand the power that we have together. So we need to be out there in the darkness, bringing as many people as we can in. But the, the other one, too, is helping each other. You see, what I'm afraid is we have people within the church, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that are discouraged. They're anxious. We struggle. We need to be there for, our, for each other. We don't want anyone to fall victim as a prisoner of war in this spiritual conflict. But we want everyone to come to that saving grace. We want everyone to come to God's provision. We want everyone to come to God's strength. And now no one in this room and no one in our community should be left behind. We need to bring them in. And that's why I think Pastor Ryan is, 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 is on 
you know, what he's doing right now because it is together. It is bringing us stronger together to increase the vision of what Pastor Kuhn did for the last 40 years. Amen? And so we're all together in this. And the rules of engagement are important. And I just want to close with this. Read the rules of engagement every day. Know what God wants us to do to succeed. Know what he wants us to do to prosper. Know what he wants us to do to have the peace of God that passes all understanding. And we'll all be victorious together. And if you don't have the strength, someone sitting next to you does. And we have all the tools and resources here at Calvary to help us to continue to stay in the fight. Amen? Amen. The rules of engagement are important as we move forward in the series and we move forward into the holiday season and we move forward into 2020. Let's stay focused on the rules that God gave us for engagement of the enemy and we will never fail. Amen? Let's stand. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Lord, we're just grateful. We humble ourselves before you now. Lord, I know that you have a way to do things, and that way keeps us safe. That way keeps us victorious. And we can't talk about war. We can't talk about the spiritual battles, the spiritual warfare that we, that we engage in. We can't talk about it without believing, Lord, that you are our commander. And we need to get to know you more so that we can hear your voice. When Jesus was here, he was concerned about the people because they were like they were sheep without a shepherd. And he called himself the good shepherd. And we will follow him because we know his voice. And we have to know that voice. Lord, humble our hearts and help us to disarm our own agenda and to pick up the agenda of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll, have, we'll be victorious in this world and beyond. So Lord, strengthen us, we pray. And as we commence into the, the Christmas season, Lord, we're going to remember you you are the reason that we celebrate. We might buy gifts. We might go to the mall. We might sing Christmas carols. We might do all sorts of things. We'll never, ever, ever forget why we celebrate it. The world will forget. And they'll try to water it down. But we as a church will always remember who came to this earth in a miraculous way. Lord, continue to empower us throughout this week, a very, very, very busy week in the church. Bring the people out that need to hear this message. Anoint each seat in this room. Help us to bring more people in because this is how we stay in the fight and be unified together and bring in the POWs, those that need your help, your salvation. We honor you today. We thank you. Protect and watch us as we travel in this rain. Lord, may be raining, but inside of us, you're shining brightly. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.